Welcome to another episode of Coach's Corner University. With me today is Paul Need. Uh, just finishing up the Coach's Corner Summit for the week. And uh, today we're just going to kind of go over some of the presentations, what, uh, what we thought was good, um, maybe what sucked, who knows, we'll get into <laughs> that. But how's everything going? It's going great, man. I had uh, probably the best squat workout, squat workout I've had in a year today um wanted to take just like a top single at six and wraps ended up hitting 694 for a single so feeling good just need more practice with the bar on my back and things will be things will be pretty sweet i'm about 16 weeks out from my meet as of now um so tons of time tons of time so does that mean you have 16 squat workouts or do you do it every other week? I think I'm going to take something heavy every other week. Uh, the weeks in between will likely be high bar. Um, yeah, I think I probably have, I don't think I'm going to take anything super heavy by any means. Uh, like the goal. So my ultimate goal is to beat Jeremy Hamilton's Canadian record at 220. So when Jeremy set his world record, he squatted 828 in wraps at 220. Mm -hmm. So my goal would be 832, which would be a, a 27 pound PR or something like that. Um, so I don't think I'll take anything over like 771 maybe. Okay. So you did but, 693 today. Yeah. So and the goal is 771. So that doesn't really leave you a lot of doesn't leave me a lot of space, but I only did a single today. And I, I like personally like to work twos and threes most of mm -hmm. the time. So I'll come back down and do some, do some threes then come back up and do some twos and maybe, maybe a one and then back up to threes and maybe undo, undulate that a little bit. Um, really liking like one top set right now, but I know in the meet, I need practice being in my wraps for more than just two or three sets. Yeah. So. I'll have to play with it a little bit, but yesterday and today was just kind of like, I'm going to take a top single at six and I hit, I hit 600 and it's really easily. I hit 640 something moving easier than the 600. And I was like, okay, I'm just going to take what's here and this will be my last jump. And uh, yeah, it went really, really well. First look feels a little uncomfortable on my back, but the more practice I get with that, the better I'll be. The heaviest set actually felt the best. So nice. And then what's the what's the point and value of doing high bar every other week? Because it's the closest variation I can get to my low bar squat without putting it low bar. Um, so just kind of saving my shoulders a little bit, especially right now, because like my arm, my hands are pretty sore, my elbows are pretty sore right now, although I just did it. Um, I, if I have to go low bar every single week, I will. Um, but if I can get away with high bar, I don't think there's any reason not to. It's, yeah. it's, as, it's so close of a variant for, because of the way I'm built and how short my femurs are. My squat really doesn't change very much um, from high bar to low bar. So how does that look? Do you do wraps with the high bar or is it just sleeves? No, I'll, is that I'll like go it's sleeves. I'll underload it, but I'll keep the RPE the same. Yeah. So RPE will be probably eight to nine, but the uh, absolute loading will definitely be a lot lower because I won't be in wraps. Okay. Sounds like a plan. It's always iterated on, right? Like I have a plan. Um, you know, after speaking with John Kylie, it kind of hit home. It's like, you can have a plan, but you never know what's really going to happen, right? Like, yeah, something not, always comes up. It's not a predictable model. That's for no, sure. Exactly. So, right. And that's what makes the there. difference between a, a coach and a programmer, right? Like being able to take those variables and, and manipulate them to fit whatever dynamic you have going on within your life, within your structure, within your physiology, and continue to morph things so that you're able to progress. And it may not look linear all the time, but if you're able to progress in a way that allows you to be healthy every day that matters, then that's the most important thing. I had this exact uh, conversation with one of my clients because he's been having a lot of regressions lately, whether it be from, you know, stressors outside of the gym or even like poor, poor weight selections in the gym. 
he keeps getting hurt and tweaked and all this stuff. And I'm like, you need to remember that you have to take what's there on the day. And the reason we had this conversation was I programmed him to do a set of, I believe it was a top single high bar and an RPE of six. And the reason I chose an RPE of six because I wanted to be a glorified warm up. He went up and he hit like, or sorry, it was a top triple at six in the front squat. He hit 463 for a single and it was a seven. And I was like, so you overshot come down, do your set of three. Oh, but that's not heavy enough to actually be, to do anything. My heaviest front squat is X. So if for an RP of six, it have to be at this percentage. It's like, no, no, no. Mm -hmm. It's a rate of perceived exertion for today, not based on your best effort. So if today your RPE of six is 405 for three, I don't care if you've done 585 a year or two, whatever ago. Right. Today, you were capable of four or five for three. And by taking that and then building upon that, you're not going to have these regressions. People get so caught up and it's not heavy enough to do anything. Well, that's the whole point of RPE because it's heavy enough for today. Right. And then you have to ask yourself, why isn't heavy enough, right? Why was I off today? What was the factors that went into today's training session to be so off, right? Is it the program? Is it the sleep? Is it the nutrition? Is there stress in my life? And those are the answers that you have to look for, but that doesn't necessarily mean that you should put, like, that's the thing that people don't get is they'll do RPE and they'll just go. And then they'll think about, oh, well, what could have elaborate, like, what can I elaborate on to why things fell off? instead of just thinking like, okay, things fell off. I'm gonna take what I can today based on what I have so I don't dig a deeper hole and then I'll figure it out. They're like, oh, I'm gonna keep digging this hole and then, and then I'll figure it out. And that's the opposite of what you want. That's not RPE. And I, have, I mean, I think we all go through this with RPE and that's why people struggle with RPE. At least people, coaches shy away from RPE much like they shy away from nutrition because it's harder because you actually have to communicate with your athletes and spend time getting to know them and, and know what works for them and know their speeds and variables. It's way easier to just give someone a percentage, right? Absolutely. But that doesn't necessarily, that's not coaching. That's just bullshit program that you stole from somebody else that you read in a book or did something with, right? So I had a client who did something very similar. He's like, yeah, I, I gave him a single RP8. And he's, he's a police officer. He's not a competitive power lifter or anything like that. And he's like, yeah, it should have been 545 today. I'm like, what do you mean it should have been 545 today? Like you went in today thinking like 545 for a single is going to be RP. That's going to like, how do you predict that? And he doesn't really have a rhyme or reason to it. And he obviously he underperformed that day. He pulled like 515 or something like that. And I'm like, well, what's your best single ever? And he's like 500. I'm like, oh, so you expected to pull a 45 pound PR at an eight. <laughs> at an eight. Based on based on what? You're a firefighter who works shitty hours and has a very stressful. So he's up and down with what he can actually do. And it's like, and then it's just a continued reiteration of like, hey, you know, RP is based on what you did, how you feel today, but how you feel today is based on the last seven days of your life, right? Culminating in today. Mm -hmm. You could have had a bad call three days ago. And that stress could have debilitated you and you're just now feeling it. You know, you could have had a rough weekend. You could have had, you know, so many factors go into that. And that's your job as a coach is to continue to kind of like piece those things out and pull those things out. And even as a coach, once you get those things, like say you're working with someone who is a firefighter, you can't write their program on it. At least I'm not going to write someone's program on a day-to-day -day basis. I'm going to be like, hey, text me how things went last night and I'll rewrite your program I don't get paid enough yeah, no. for that. Yeah. But in an ideal world, that's what you want, right? But what you want to do is in your case and in my case, I don't know how you handled it, but he overshot his RPE. He had a bad day. So for me, that means that I have to go into the next program and phase that I do for him and 
undulate some of that volume to get rid of that fatigue that he just built up by overshooting things. Right. Mm -hmm. So I told him, Hey, tomorrow, when you go into the gym to train, because you, you missed the weight today, that's going to put a lot of stress on you. You're already feeling a little bit fatigued. Let's lower your RPEs a, a little bit more or not, not even that, right. Let's lower your volume a little bit more. So I cut off a set on each of his, he has five exercises that he does. Uh, for that day, I cut a set off of each one and kept the RP the same just to decrease that volume to decrease that stressor. And I was like, hey, let me know how you feel two days from now. Right. And this that's that ongoing back and forth that you have to have as a coach client relationship in order for you to get the most out of that client. Right. Because you can't expect them to be perfect. You can't expect it's like in a good relationship right? It's like, I just thought you knew me. So I figured we would be on the same page. It's like, how do you, you know, how do you know someone unless you actually talk to them? Like you have to communicate. You can't just read their mind. You can't predict the future. And um, that's kind of what you're hitting at, right? Like you have this 16 week goal, can't predict what's going to happen, but you have to, you have to have at least a structure in place so that you have, you know, a roadmap to get you to where you want to go. Exactly. For this guy, like, I mean, it was a top triple at six and he hit a single at seven. So I, I, I really just told him, Hey, take your top triple, go down, take a top triple and then finish your workout. And because the RPs were so low, I didn't need to adjust anything else. Cause and it was a front squat too. So it was, yeah, was already, exactly. yeah. Um, but if it had been like a more, a more serious thing, like, Hey, I want you to do a top double at eight and you ended up hitting a single at nine. Well, yeah, then we're definitely going to adjust. Uh, maybe the rest of the week, maybe perhaps even the next week, um, depending on how the feedback comes back. Um, and that, I think that comes down to the communication again, as you mentioned, because like, I know this guy's had some stress outside the gym. I know that he's had some issues with his nutrition because of that stress. So I know there's a lot on his plate. So if I can tailor back the training to let that stuff dissipate a little bit, Training is just the easiest variable to manipulate because a lot of the time our lifestyle is, is out of our control. Right. And I've talked a lot about, you know, auto-regulating your life. And that's all well and good to say, but not everyone works from home and can cook all their meals and, you know, doesn't have children and all this stuff. Like sometimes that shit's out of your control. So training is what uh, is, is your outlet, for example. Instead of looking for this catharsis through effort in your training approach it with a little bit more uh, a little bit more of an intellectual uh, viewpoint and say well if I set the training at the appropriate amount and intensity I can still go in and work really really hard and not set myself back yeah but if you go in with the intention of oh I'm so stressed I have my coach said RP8 has to be X amount of weight. I'm just going to, you're just going to keep digging it all. Whereas if you come in, you do what's prescribed, you train as hard as you can within the constraints of the workout, you stack a win and then you leave motivated instead of, you know, maybe doing a hard workout, but overall you took an L. Right. Yeah. Cause I mean, the intent is the thing that you get out of that, right? It's not how hard can you train? It's can you follow the program? And the intent of the program is, an RP8 that may not live up to your standards that day, but that doesn't mean you should overshoot your standards. That means something went wrong to, to lower those standards and you have to figure that out. And, um, you know, I think that's important. I, the communication piece is, is critical, being able to, to talk to your, your athletes about that and really get them to understand, right, that auto-regulation has so many variables and so many factors to it, but that's the most accurate way for you to track what's going on day to day to avoid injury, right? That's the biggest thing with RPE is you're trying to avoid injury. You're when you don't do RPE based training and you're doing things like percentages, you're constantly going to be chasing a fatigue state. If you're not mm -hmm. making those adjustments to that person, right? And you can, how can you make those adjustments because you're giving them a fixed percentage, right? So I think that's something that needs to be reiterated time and time again is, you know, auto-regulating how you feel as an athlete is going to create more longevity in your, in your life. And knowing that, you know, you may not be your best every single day and that's fine as long as you're the best on the platform, right? And the best you can be based on the yeah. circumstances. And I think something to communicate to them 
is when you start to regress their training, they see that as a negative, like, oh, I'm going to take a step back. And it's like, no, we're regressing your training, your volume, so you can continue to progress with the weight on the bar, right? We're taking away sets, but that's not going to make you worse. That's going to allow you to continue to progress, right? And I think that's something that a lot of lifters don't truly understand. They have that more is better approach, volume drives, adaptation. And you're like, well, if you take away my volume, then I'm going to get worse. And the way I tell people, um, a lot of my athletes is if you're in a high stress environment, right? That's like, you're going into your workout four sets deep already. And you haven't even touched the weight yet. Right. So we need to figure out a way to pull those four sets out so that you can still progress. Right. That's, and that's something that they need to understand is that you're taking a step back within the program to allow for progression still. You're not yeah. taking a step back so you can regress from the program as well. And that's, again, that's a communication thing that you have to continue to do. And it happens on the other end too. Like, so I went into today's workout, didn't really know what to expect. I haven't been in flat shoes, in wraps over a year, like well over a year. And I've never handled anything over 620 in flat shoes and wraps. I haven't handled anything over six, 606 uh, in a year. Yeah. And that was in sleeves. And I was like, ah, if I hit anything over 600 at, like, at the RP, I'll be really happy today. Right. And I went in and I was like, oh, like, things are moving really easily. I feel really comfortable. Um, so I took what was there. 694 is there. It's like, cool. But if I go in next time and I accumulated too much, I, I pushed it too far, I guess, and things regress, I just have to adjust and, and move forward. Um, and then there, but you know what else I didn't do is like, it was like, oh man, 694 felt so good. I'm so amped. Like I'm going to go 720, <laughs> right? which I probably, I totally could have smoked 720 today, but that's not the plan. I don't need to smoke 720 today. I need to smoke 832 in 16 weeks. Right. Yeah. And that was that thing that got um, pushed with Brandon Lilly, right? Where it was like, if the stove is hot, keep cooking or something like yeah. that, right? Some Phil Billy redneck saying that they come up with in Kentucky. And it's like, no, if, if things feel good, that's like a sign that your program's working, not that you need to push it today to make things feel worse the next day. Exactly. I thought that was the dumbest thing when that came out, but people, people loved it. It gave them a, an opportunity to really push their training and, and hit some gym PRs that looked cool on Instagram. And then they go to the meet and it's like, mm, not really showing up today. I'd love to hear your thoughts on this too. So, okay. It's kind of my first experience with it because I'm, I would still consider myself pretty novice when it comes to pushing assistance work to failure. It's not something I had typically done for the last six months. Um, so the last squat day that I did was in sleeves, hit a top single at six and then a three by three um, at like 85 to 90% of that top set. Then I moved on to snatch grip walk this, so hit 500 for, for eight. I was like, okay, that's great. Come back to this squat day again. Now I'm in wraps and it's only one top set of one. And then no more down sets, just one top set of one because I knew I'd be fucked up. And I underperformed on my snatch grip block pulls. And I was like, yeah. huh, volume didn't tire me out as much as a single. But then I look at the loading parameter of that top single versus the loading parameter of those, you know, seven reps that I did in sleeves. I'm like, would you consider that in your you know, progressive overload? Would you compare that those snatch grip block pulls to the snatch grip block pulls that I did on my sleeve day? Or would you look at it as almost a different movement because the, the sequencing of it is different? I wouldn't look at it as a different movement, but I would look at it as a different area to start your progression scheme again. Okay. Right. So do you, do you wrap yourself? Yes. Right. So that's another factor you have to take in. That's going to accumulate fatigue. True. Right. So you're wrapping yourself, which not only does wrapping yourself accumulate fatigue, but it also sucks and it makes you tired. Right. <laughs> yeah. It's like the hardest thing you can do as a power lifter is wrap yourself or wrap someone else. Right. That's the only time I'm sweating when I'm power, <laughs> when I'm power lifting, but that, 
perception of effort that you're doing to do the reps, to do the squat, to mentally get ready, right? Those are things that are very acute in nature that create fatigue in that two to four hour paradigm, right? So that's that fatigue that you're accumulating because of that, right? So you may go do high bar next week and blow out your snatch grip based on last week because you haven't done, right? So there's, so I would just progress them like, and then that's maybe when, instead of pushing your assistance work to failure, that you start doing more RPE based assistance work. So then Mm. you're going by how you feel on that day, right? And then some days you can take it a little bit further and then some days you can't, right? And that's just something you have to play with to make sure that your main lift is progressing the way you want it to progress, right? Because you're, you're gonna be having more load on your back, which is gonna be more um, lower back fatiguing. Then if you're doing a snatch grip, which is very lower back, mid back fatiguing, that's you're already going into it in a more fatigued state acutely, right? Because mm-hmm. right, the heavier stuff is going to fatigue you right, more peripherally, more within the muscle. Right. So when you go into your assistance work, those muscles are already fatigued to a certain extent, more so than right the central nervous system being fatigued. And then just the perception of effort. I think that's the biggest thing, the perception of effort, wrapping yourself, getting psyched up, not even getting psyched up, but just mentally being ready to hit like a perfect rep, right? Yeah, I'm like, I did, I did that snatch grip set, and I was kind of, I was like, am I gonna be getting mad here? Like, is this gonna be like <laughs> one of the old days? Or I'm like, you motherfucker! Like, and I was like, wait a second, I just hit 700 pounds after not touching 700 pounds in however long in right. my self wrapped shitty in my shit wraps. I'm like. That's, today's a good day. I'm going to just keep moving on. <laughs> right. Because at the end of the day, right, what's the things that matter? Not your exactly. assistance work. Is, no. is your, your, your top sets moving or your competition list moving, right? You may you may improve your, your squat every single week and your snatch grip may go down every single week. And who cares, right? If your squat's going up, that's all that matters. It's what, 834 pounds or two, two, two pounds, 32 pounds. Yeah. That's all that matters, man. That's all that matters. I got to out-total you, too. Well, yeah, you should. I have to. At this you'll point, be, I have to. You'll be close, for sure, especially if you hit that squat. Well, uh, if I go... If I go don't, hit, don't, don't hit it on your fourth attempt where it doesn't count for your total. No, 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 no. I'll probably Pay take it on a second and scratch my third. Oh, nice. <laughs> it's just, I only got so many bullets in the chamber here. <laughs> Well, okay. Explain that to me then, right? Like why not? You're still going to hit the same amount of of sets. No, no, I'm fucking with you. I'm going to take three attempts. Okay. Well, some people do that, right? Yeah. I don't get that either. You still have to take the same number of attempts and only two of them counts. It's like, right. Oh yeah. But if I miss it, I can come back and take it. Like you're not fucking missing an 832 squat and then come back and hit it. That's sweet. Um, (laughs) Yeah. So I'll take that on a third. And then, so if I go 832, and then if I pull 744, then I and I tie my PR bench, which is 430, then I'll get that 2,000. Nice. So it's close. Yeah. See what happens, man. 16 weeks is a lot of time to fuck it up or to get get better. You know, it's up to you. you. Just gotta start. To, it gets, just gotta start taking creatine again. Mm, load it up. 20 oh, grams a day. 20 <laughs> for 16 weeks. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Oh man. All right. So we just finished the summit. Yeah. Everything went very well. Um, super happy with the quality of content that we had. Me too. Out it was there, amazing. Right? We had not only great presenters, but what they were able to extrapolate on and, and dig into and just the variety of it, I think is something that's extremely valuable. The first day I think is, is like one of those sleeper days where people don't really pay a lot of t- attention to it because it's not the X's and O's, but I think mm-hmm. as a coach and as someone who wants to make a living as a coach and building a business, that might've been the most important day of all. I think so too. Like, I mean, as a, so I, I kind of went, went through this bit of a transformation this past year where I went from being a guy who coaches and writes programs for people and helps them with their nutrition to being a business owner who does that as well. and there was a lot of growing pains during that period that 
like especially Todd and, and Lauren touched on that we all go through of you know establishing systems, creating your own way of doing things, how to promote buy-in, how to do all these things that you kind of do already but don't have a system for. And then when you touch on mental health, you know as well as I do, especially when coaching nutrition, you're you become immediately like a pseudo therapist at some point. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's tough, it's really tough to navigate. So like starting with Crystal's talk about like emotional first aid, as a coach, just having some knowledge around men, like proper mental health, warning signs, things that you can look to to you know refer out if you need to, or how to kind of rework someone's mentality towards something more positive, or how to change your approach to help them navigate their difficult situation. I think oftentimes we know a lot of this stuff, but having a professional iterate that, you know, your process is one that is, we'll say effective or evidence-based, it's nice to hear, it's nice to reaffirm, and it also helps you refine that approach to an even greater level. Yeah, I think the the biggest thing about crystals was like the warning signs, right? Because as a as a coach, you can either make the situation far worse by the way you can just, you can, I mean, it's not always going to be so obvious, right? And that's the thing is you're not, they're not going to come to you and tell you everything. Like I, uh, Jordan Peters is a big time coach in the UK and a very smart guy. He made a post the other day talking about um, how people bad mouth binge like binge eating type of stuff and mm -hmm. and he's like that's just you know the, the worst thing you can do as a coach is be that person that starts to shoot down all these negative words because then you're going to create this fear that your clients are going to not want to communicate with you right if you're a coach that says you know if you can't follow the plan you're weak and then you have a client who doesn't follow the plan that client's not going to want to communicate that to you right and his biggest thing was like, you know, if you fall off the plan, the best thing you could do is communicate to your coach of why that is. And he's like, a lot of times the reason is because mentally you're not ready to diet and we need to bring your calories up to a point where you're not so food focused that you do those binges, right? And if you don't tell your coach that, you could be two, three months in on that disordered eating path that you're creating such a deficit mentally, right? That it does become, you know, a, a disease or a disorder. Right. If you would just tell them right away, like, hey, I messed up on the program and you build that relationship with them to where they feel open and honest with you, then you're going to be able to help them out. Right. And that's the biggest thing when it comes to coaching and what what Crystal was talking about is like you need to have a desire to actually want to help people with everything besides just what they they're hiring you for. Right. You have to want to care about that person. You want to know what's going on in their life. You know, if, if you work with a client for a year and you didn't know they were married with like two kids, you're not, you're not doing your job, right? No. Like you have to be able to open up those lines of communication to get to know your clients so that they feel like they can trust you enough to tell you when anything's going on. And then you can find those warning signs and then you can either say, hey, we see this is happening. These are some warning signs, you know. I'm not an expert, but this is what I think may be beneficial to you. We can try these things out, but if you continue to go down this path, um, these are the people I would refer you out to. And we have people yeah. like Amanda Rizzo, Crystal Miranda, right? People we're building this network with, with Coach's Corner that we feel like can help people out with this stuff. But being able to find those warning signs, being able to have that open communication was I think the, the best takeaway that uh, Crystal had from her, her talk. Yeah, I actually, like, I want to share an anecdote. So I actually just took on, I took on a new client maybe three weeks ago. And uh, when I do onboarding, I will record myself speaking over the program, explaining the whole thing. I'll do the same thing with the nutrition check-in. And then my email has about three Word, Word, like Microsoft Word pages full of information in the email. Like, this is why we're doing what we're doing. And the client asked me probably like six to 10 questions that were answered in that email. Yeah. 
So I respectfully said, hey, could you do me a favor and please reread my initial email? I feel like you're not, you're, I'm either not communicating effectively to you or you didn't do a good enough job reading. Either way, can you reread it? Hey, I just reread it. You won't, you won't get any more stupid questions from me. And immediately I was like, you know, this isn't necessarily mental health related, but it is communication related. And my response was, there's no such thing as a stupid question. I just want to make sure that I've communicated effect effectively to you. If you're afraid to ask me questions and you're afraid to communicate with me, this, this coaching relationship is not going to work. Yeah. And he was like, he's like, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. I'm sorry. I didn't read it clearly. You communicated it very well. You know, have a great week since then. No issues. Yeah. I would have went about that a little bit different. I would have said clearly based on this conversation, you've determined that you're an idiot. So you're going to ask a lot of dumb questions. Just keep asking them. Don't worry about it. I love answering dumb questions. So bring them on. Can't help that you're stupid. We'll just work around that. That's the way I would have went. Pretty solid. To be honest, I think how it would have went was <laughs> you ask a lot of stupid questions. I don't think I can coach you anymore. See you later. Here's your money. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I mean, that happens, right? And what you, what you did there is you also reiterated the fact that like, hey, you know, you may have worked with other coaches before that didn't give you pertinent information when you talk to them. The things I'm giving you is going to be very helpful. So make sure that you thoroughly read those things, right, to where we can get past the fluff of a check-in, right? Lauren talked about this a little bit as well with yeah. the leadership strategies of, right? Like making sure that you're streamlining line things so much to where this person knows these are the key things that I need to check in with to get the things going that I need to get going. I don't need to bother my coach with, uh, you know, 80 million things that are oversaturating that email. And as a coach, you need to reiterate like, hey, these are the important things we need to get through within this check-in. You know, these are the things that I'm looking for. Make sure that you're always answering these questions. And then if you have anything else outside of that, I'd love to continue to help you with that. But making sure that you're constantly like defining the, the questions and, and the answers is going to be something that's, that's crucial. And that's something that, that Lauren touched upon within her conversation amongst uh, a bunch of other strategies for coaches. Hers, hers was very valuable in the idea that if you're a new coach and you're trying to build out something that's scalable mm -hmm. as a coach, that's the way you should be setting up your business is something that you could scale. She pretty much laid it out exactly how you'd want to do that. And if you do that from the very beginning, you're going to you're not going to waste, like, it's just going to be such a time saver and such a hassle relief that you'll be very thankful that you went over all those strategies. Yeah. It's something I really liked her talk because it's something that I go over with the young coaches that I mentor when it comes to check-ins and programming and systems, having actual procedures and hell you and I just talked about this yesterday, having systems in place for everything we do with coaches corner so that literally it's just a handbook of like, this is how we run our business because that way you know what your expectations are that way everyone on is on the same page so if your client knows that their check-in is is needed within the 24 hours on saturday you're going to reply it within the 24 hours on sunday you provide them all the information you're able to take in that information and review it and give it back you know you're getting all the pertinent ones the biggest point for more from lauren's talk that i i think might have been missed by a few people was even though she runs a very successful, multiple successful businesses, she's always reiterating on her processes. She's always yeah. trying to improve them. She's always trying to make them better. And that's something that I try to do with like, even something like my check-in sheet. I've changed my check-in sheet a few times in the last couple of months just to include something different, include another, another box, change the way I word certain things, include other bits of data, uh, I probably have three or four different check-in sheets based on, is this person doing, uh, if it fits your macros, is this person doing uh, nutrient timing? Is this person doing carb cycling? They're all a little bit different because I need a little bit different information from all of those people. The end result is I've put accountability onto my client to follow through. They have more autonomy. They have more, um, they have more skin in the game. They're more likely to be uh, adherent. And then I get all the information that I need on the back end. Right. Um, 
so setting up systems and then continuously iterating on them until you get to you know that perfect level which is always going to be changing mm -hmm. and then realizing that you're if you're only one person like lauren has multiple people who work for her mm -hmm. so she's got that other level of uh of organization that she has to have if you're working for yourself the more you systematize your business the more you can scale it but you have to know that there is an upper limit for the service model that you're trying to run. The way you and I coach strength, we can't have many clients. Right. Right. Mm -hmm. That means that if we want to earn a certain amount of money, we have to charge a more premium price. But we know that our clients are getting a more premium service. And, and I think pricing is something that I don't that not many people want to talk about. And they just pull this number out of their hat, their hat. It's like, I'm going to charge this much. Well, number one, are you providing a service that's worth that much money? Are you spending the appropriate amount of time that would mandate you charge what you charge? And two, is there room for you to move up as you continue to iterate on your process and make it even better? Yeah. If you set your prices at you know $100, $100 a month, well, if you wanna earn $10,000 a month, you have to you have to have a hundred clients. There's no way you can provide a good service for a hundred clients. Right. Now, if you only want to have 50 clients and you charge $200 a month, well, with 50 clients, you have more time. With more time, you should be able to provide a better service, and that better service will likely mandate that $200 a month price tag. Right now, you can check my website. I charge $175 a month Canadian plus tax. If you live in Canada, you pay tax. Now, do I think I could charge more? Yes. Will I be charging more? Yes, but not until I increase the service delivery of my product. Because I'm not going to just charge more because I want to charge more. It has to come along with some sort of improvement. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Yeah. And that's kind of, Todd touched on that a little bit with the 80-20 thing, right? Yes. If you're able to focus, you know, 20% of your efforts on the thing that's driving 80% of your income, that's going to be, so if you can get those higher priced individuals that are willing to pay you the money for your service, not only are they more likely to stick to the plan, but those are the people who actually probably can give you the, the income that you want, right? Mm -hmm. you, you may want to work with the best power lifters and athletes in the world, but I can promise you they can work with anyone for free. So why are they going to pay you premium dollars, right? The, the likelihood of you getting to work with those top guys and charge them is not a business model that's going to be highly sustainable. Most of the guys who are the top of their sports, they, they probably don't pay for their program at all. I can almost guarantee you that. Um, I, I know several coaches who give extreme discounts as they poach clients from other people <laughs> to, to build out their clientele base. Who would that be? No, I mean, I, I, I started coaching. I mean, I started coaching a, a couple like bigger name lifters and uh, they all pay the same. I mean, that's that I'm not in here to, I mean, I could offer them the, the service for free, but I know in my mind, if I was offering it for free, I wouldn't want to do it. Right. So I mean, <laughs> that is what it is. But um, when it comes to Todd's discussion, one thing like i mean i got taught to speak because he was the first mentor that i had who showed me that the athlete was most important right everyone else, like i shouldn't say everyone else but like the mentors i had previous were more focused on either the system that they were running so i mean ron ron at south florida was I think he was in terms of strength conditioning, he was a pioneer of having multiple businesses, right? Yeah, he, he had he was a strength coach, he was an author, he had education platforms, like he he did a lot of stuff. And I learned a lot from him. But his approach was so systematized because he had to be. He had so many things on the go. And then Frank, who eventually you know went to UCLA and, and did a bunch of great things there, again, very systems oriented. He ran it like a military, uh, military program where you know shoes shoes tied shirts tucked everybody's in the same lines everyone does the same thing we're a unit todd was the first one who's like yo we have a hundred people on our football team we have a hundred athletes 
each one of them needs to be treated differently because they're all different people. And I was like, man, that's so overwhelming. But yeah, it is. But that's also your job as a coach to coach mm -hmm. people. And uh, one thing that he hit on, on his talk was, you know, the culture you create, he didn't say this, this quote, but this is a quote that he told me that, you know, always kind of hit home was like, are you the thermostat or are you the thermometer? The thermostat sets the temperature. If you show up and, or if you become involved in an athlete's program, they're going to feed off of the energy that you give them. Their belief in you is going to shape what their outcomes are going to be, right? We talked about that with John Kiley. And if you, if you feed off of them and, and you only give them back what they give you, that's not going to be a very successful coach athlete relationship. Right. Uh, and that, that like Todd does that better than anyone I, I know, to be honest. Yeah. It's, it's also staying within your boundaries of your personality too. Can you, can you kick your, your goddamn dog? Jesus I'm doing it. I got Christ. <laughs> but yeah, the idea is right. Once you, once you create this, this standard as, as a coach based on who you are as a person, that's the important thing. That's the, that's what you want to continue to build on and reiterate over and over, right? You'll have some coaches who are very much the hype coaches, Sorry, folks. <laughs> the hype coaches and they'll, they'll get you going. But if that's not your personality, then don't don't start to be that person, right? Stay true to who you are and build buy-in through those things. Because you build buy-in by caring about the athletes and letting them know that you care about them. And also you build buy-in by, by walking the walk, right? When you're dealing with any type of athlete, if you're not willing to go through the things that they're willing to go through, they're not going to listen to you. And that's something that is very valuable when it comes to that coach athlete dynamic. Um, I don't know if it's as valuable in powerlifting. I think a lot of people value it. I don't necessarily think that that is something that should be as valued um, because there's a lot of really strong people that don't know shit about coaching. Uh, but I know when you're working with athletes, you don't have to be the best athlete, but if you, you know, if you're doing, if you're working with MMA, and you've never done MMA, you better start doing jujitsu or something to just, how else are you going to be able to intellectually program for them, knowing what they're having to go through if you've never gone through it, right? If you don't know what the stress of a 90 minute session is, where they have to do jujitsu for 90 minutes, and then they have to come back and do Muay Thai for 60, and then MMA for another 60, then you want them to do your strength training program. Like, if you've never gone through that, you have no clue what kind of stress and fatigue they're coming with and, and they're not going to trust you. They're not going to buy into that. So I think that's something that's valuable. You may not have to have played college ball, but if you're lifting and you're strong and you're trying to get after it with your athletes and they see you getting after it, you may be there at 4 a.m. training and training hard and they see that they're going to respect that. And I think that's something that, that Todd talked about a lot too, was just building that buy-in, building that respect for the coach and the athlete. That's how I started powerlifting. Yeah. Ron, I mean, Ron straight up told me, he's got, he goes, these guys don't respect you. Yeah. Like, you don't do anything. You've never played ball. And as soon as I started, I told them all that I was going to compete in a powerlifting meet and they saw me training for it, immediate buy. Yeah. I was like, oh, I guess I should probably do this. Right. Yeah. I think there's, there's something to that, right? You don't have to be the best. You just have to put in the work. Definitely not the best. <laughs> that, that's that's one of the biggest things right like even even when where you're at right you, you get to train around guys like ian valier oh. and ian valier's training partner is not a pro no i don't even know if he's ever done bodybuilding before mark he's doing his first show sometime soon but ian he's also said, like 18 or something ian says that's the best training partner he's ever had on his podcast right and it's yeah. like why is that? And it's like, because the kid fucking goes there to train every single day. He goes there to get the best out of himself and the best out of his training partners, right? He's not the best. He's not, he's not a pro bodybuilder, but he's the best training partner. And that's the same thing with the coach, right? You don't have to be the best coach in the world. You just have to try and you have to care about your athletes. And that'll eventually make you the best coach in the world, right? For your given uh, atmosphere. On that note, currently accepting applications for my training partner. I need one. 
Yeah, that's the, uh, yeah, that's a tough one, man. Because it's power, I mean, depending on how you, like with, with bodybuilding, right? You can just kind of follow the same programs a lot of times. Yeah. With powerlifting, for some reason, you can follow the same programs, but people just hate doing that. Power I just need someone been. who's going to squat on the same day I squat, bench on the same day I bench, and deadlift. Yeah, deadlift. that's what I did with Sean. Right, we had different different philosophies of training. They were they were still pretty similar, but we squatted on the same day, we benched on the same day, we deadlifted on the same day, and uh, that's definitely something that's pretty valuable. That must have been quite emasculating. Uh, no, I I found it to. Uh, like I, I knew where I, I know what you're trying to do and I'm just not going to buy into it, <laughs> but I found my threshold of where I was at compared to his threshold. Right. And then I learned how to talk shit within that. Right. Perfect. So he could, he could out squat me by 200 pounds. But if I, out, if I got up to like something where he only out squatted me by like 150, I talk shit about it. Right. So I was able to find that threshold to still, can because like, I mean, what do you do? He's one of the top five strongest guys in the world. I'm not going to push him, right? Yeah. But at least true. I can like fire him up. And like, if he sees me getting better too, then he'll he'll want to get better oh, yeah. as well, right? And Absolutely. That's something that I can do. You know, you don't, like I said, man, if you just try hard, people are going to respect you and you don't have to be nearly as strong as them. That's what people get this misconception of like, oh, I don't want to work in, I don't want to train with you because you're just so much stronger. I'm like, no. Oh, that's if you, bullshit. If you yeah. put the weight on the bar and you take the weight off the bar that you put, like if we're working together and we're trying to get better, I don't care if you squat 300 pounds and I squat 800, it doesn't matter to me, right? 100%. I think that's, uh, that's important. We're getting long-winded with these breakdowns here. We're not going to get through all of them today. Yeah, I mean... We can keep, I, I mean, overall, like day, day two, for example, we had, um, we had Adam talking about bobsleigh, which, you know, Adam's one of those people, if he didn't know, who, like most people wouldn't know who he is. Okay. Cause he's just Canadian guy. He's actually, he's actually American, uh, born in Louisville, um, was on the U S bobsleigh team, married a Canadian bobsledder moved to Canada. Now he's one of the, uh, one of the push coaches for team Canada and the nuance that he approached bobsleigh, I think is transferable to anything that we all do because he's looking at the difference in ground, ground contact. He's looking at the difference in the weight of the push sled versus, you know, if they're running a one, a, a two man sled or a four man sled, looking at distances and times and splits and, and saying, okay, how can I maximize these guys for the given demands of their sport? And then he's taking data, he's looking at his data and he's adapting this process. I think that's, that is representative of a nuanced approach to training. I also know that none of his people follow the same program. They do certain things together, like all their speed work they do together, but different guys will have different volumes. And then when it comes to training, they all follow a slightly different training plan, but if it's a lower body day, it's a lower body day. If it's, you know, so they are all training in a group. And that sort of approach to sports performance is something that I think a lot of people take for granted. It's like, he thought he could lift them heavy all the time. Well, newsflash, can't do that. All right. Right. And he figured it out. And he, uh, he developed his own, I wouldn't say philosophy, but he developed his own system of training that fit within the needs of the athletes he was coaching for the sport that they're participating in. And he, he took from many different spots. Like he, he talked about uh, Cal Dietz. He talked about even Verka Shonson. He talked about Laura Phelps Stackhouse because he, he trained at her gym. He's coming into it from with a lot of different influences and he adapted what was, what was beneficial from each philosophy into something that's his own. Yeah, I, th I think a lot of people fall into the trap of I'm a, I'm a West Side person, or I'm a block periodization person, or I'm a this, or I'm a that. So why can't you just be you and have a philosophy of your own based on the information that you've assimilated into something that works for you and the people you work with? Right. I think having that like uh, 
pigeonholed approach to defining yourself as this or that isn't an athlete centered approach, right? You, right. you need to have a great, if, if you're going to be a great coach, the best thing you can do is come up with an amazing needs analysis assessment, and then either have the right people to fix those or have enough tools in your toolbox to get them going in the right direction. Because, you, you know, one of the things I think about when I'm watching sports, right, is like the asymmetries within sports. And then as a strength coach, how do we fix those, right? Like you said, contact time, ground contact time, you watch basketball players, right? And if you continue to watch basketball players, you'll notice, okay, this person always leads their, their jump with their right foot, right? How many times in a game are they jumping off their right foot to do a dunk, to do whatever, right? Okay, they're doing that 50 more times a game than their left leg. Well, how can we fix that asymmetry within their training program, right? Because if we don't, that right leg is going to become very dominant. That left leg is going to get very weak. Guess what's going to go out? on a non-contact injury, their left, their left leg, right? Because it's not getting that same amount of work. So you have to pay attention to those things. And I think that those like minute details are what's very, very valuable with the strength coach, right? Cause I mean, sure you can squat anyone and get them stronger. That's, mm-hmm. that's an easy thing to do, right? But if it's like looking at, like when I went to that, the NSCA conference uh, last week or two weeks ago, something like that, I don't know. Mm-hmm time seems to just fade here hmm. in and out, right? Oh, yeah. <laughs> but Pete Bomarito was there, right? And he was talking about, oh, cool. um, yeah, it was it was a very cool present. He talks so goddamn fast. Yes. And he covers so much stuff. It was very, but he was thinking, he was talking about like inversion, eversion of the foot, right? And where that person plants and how that person, so why aren't we training them in those styles to get them more resistant in that in that load parameter, right? Why aren't we doing more everted type stuff? And then how can we look at that eversion and inversion and how can we put that into their training programs to allow them to be able to continue to resist and create as much force as possible? So one thing that Adam talked about and, and we've actually talked about it since is he works on stiffness in his athletes, in the ankle yeah. specifically. And I was like, okay, like, that's really interesting. And one of the ways that he does that is all of their split squats, he does them heel floating. Yep. I'm like, oh, that's super easy. Right. You want to create stiffness in the ankle, load it. And what else, what else does that do, right? It right. decreases exactly. the load parameters that the athlete has to put on their body to get the adaptation that they're looking for. So their risk of injury of lifting too heavy of weights, which they don't really need to be doing, is diminished, but it still feels hard for them too, right? Exactly. So you're killing two birds with one stone. And I think as, as an athletic developer, even as a strength coach, you're always thinking about that, right? It's like, how can I keep this person as healthy as possible, make them as resilient as possible? So when it's time to fucking push, I can just drive this person into the ground and I know they're not going to break and we're going to come out at the other end stronger, faster, and bigger than ever. I think that that flows well into Jared's Jared's talk about motor control, and uh, one thing that he spoke about a lot, and it kind of plays into what we were, we've been talking about recently with regards to specificity, is that we need practice. Yeah, and we need we need practice, and we need to be able to develop mastery. And without practice, we can't have mastery. Um, so, being having elements of specificity within your program and providing opportunities for sports practice. Um, has tremendous value, not only from obviously like the muscular and biochemical perspective, but from a motor learning perspective. People forget that, you know, as we develop our patterns, we develop these motor engrams. And these motor engrams are essentially uh, neurological pathways to perform the movement. The more proficient you get within that movement, the more variable your engram can be with the same output. So an example would be you perform a squat with no visual stimulation, and then you perform that same squat, but somebody walks in front of you, right? So that's another input. But with that other input, you still have the same output, motor control, right? So if we're not practicing, we're not proficient, we haven't developed mastery, those little things of, oh my God, you ran in front of me while I'm squatting, which is bullshit. You train in a fucking gym. (laughs) Anyway. these are things that matter because at a meet, you're staring at the crowd, right? What if the what if the ref is closer to you than you're used to? What you know, all of these factors come into play. Um, 
but I think Jared hit home and, is, and really did a great job of explaining, you know, what motor control is, how you can implement it into your training and how to have a better understanding of developing mastery. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I mean, Jared does like real actual scientific work that's helping yes. people improve their lives. He works with, uh, he worked um, Parkinson's patients, right? Yeah. And he's trying to develop um, systems and, and tools to put in place for a training modality to help with Parkinson's and um, doing, re I know that's what he was, the research he was doing at UF. I'm not entirely sure what he's doing at Appalachian State, but I'm pretty, it's pretty similar, I believe. Similar, yeah. Yeah. And yeah, I mean, tons, tons of good points there, right? It's like, that's something that I see getting implemented a lot with uh, Cal Dietz was talking about this with his athletes is like, what's the, what's the next step in training, right? What's the next thing that we can start to do to prepare our athletes for the demands of performing in front of a crowd or in a fatigue state, how can they continue to improve? And they're doing that a lot with the military as well, right? It's like, all right, let's get these guys really tired. And then now we're going to do some cognitive awareness fire situations to make sure they're not killing innocent people or to make sure they can still hit on target, right? And I think there's a lot of dynamics to that. Like you said, introducing those things from a powerlifting perspective. If you're, if you're a strength training and you're, you're a coach and you're teaching someone to squat, maybe with a mirror in front of them so they can get that down and then eventually having them squat without the mirror, then eventually having them squat with you sitting in front of them, pretending you're going to be the head judge and then leading them into the meet doing that type of stuff. So where they get to the meet, they don't even see the head judge because you've been sitting in front of them the entire time and they're still able to perform at a high level of, of proficiency. And I think that's something that's extremely important, right? And I remember the a funny story Dan told me when he was in Russia, he competed in Russia for the first time and he was getting ready to do his opener squat. And one of the ring card girls walked out in front of him and he was like, oh shit, I didn't expect that to happen. <laughs> <laughs> so, so then he said from, from then on, he's like, he, he never focused on anything that could possibly come in front of him. Like he just got so focused on the lift. And I, I felt that way too, towards the end of my power lifting was like, I, could honestly tell you I could never tell you who the head judge was in a meet I couldn't tell you because I, I could never see him the only th the only head judge I remember was Steffi on my lap on my deadlift at showdown deadlifts are, what, deadlifts are a little bit different squats I can't remember anything no Gene Reislack I just know Gene used because I used to compete in the RPS they were the only like monolith fed up here for a while mm, no. um I it's funny you said that about the ring card girl uh Jeremy Hamilton always used to look down at his squats. And I was like, why do you always look down, Jared? He's like, I don't want to look the judge in the face. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I was like, All right. I mean, the ground's not going anywhere. So, right. Yeah. So you have to, I mean, those are things you have to, to think about, right. To improve that, that motor control um, in, in a performance aspect. There's a lot of things that come with skill acquisition, right. External versus internal cues and, and how can we continue to improve our, our dynamics and skill acquisition? Once we have a skill master, quote unquote, how can we continue to create novel adaptations so that we can continue to improve on that, right? And it's the idea of going back to what you were talking about with Lauren. It's like constant refinement, right? It's like, yes. can I brace a little bit better? Can I do this a little bit better? Well, how can I create more force? Do I need to have more stability? Well, what can I do to create better stability? Right. And then maybe I can pick accessories to create that better stability instead of picking accessories to drive hypertrophy. Right. Maybe things like everything needs a shift to create this novel stimulus so that you can continue and to have progressive skill acquisition because you need those 10,000 hours, supposedly. Um, supposedly. By, yeah. The, the Anders Eric's or Eric, Eric Anderson's uh, research that showed that. Right. And it's like, the, the key thing to take away from that is you just need a lot of deliberate work at something to get better at it, right? You can't just go through the motions from Absolutely. day one to the last day you squat, there needs to be a deliberate effort to get better. And that's something that the research has shown time and time again. And that's something that we see all the time, right? You go into a gym and you have people that just show up and you go there and you see them every single day and two years pass and they look exactly the same. And you're like, man, what, like you didn't change anything. You didn't get any stronger, you didn't get any bigger. Yeah. You know, you have some, some months where you're a little bit leaner, some months where you're a little bit fatter. And it's like, what, like, 
why do you come to the gym? He's like, I just, I just come to the gym and train, man. I don't really think about anything. It's like, well, okay, well, that's it, right? It's that deliberate practice to get better. And that's something that um, you can extrapolate from, from Jared's ideas. And then the last one we'll touch on is, is Ian's multiple modality program. And, and if, if anyone's going to be able to talk about that at a high level, I think yeah. he's a great person to, to do that. So do you want to roughly touch on his real pass? Yeah, the biggest take home for me when he was talking is um, he does a really good job of developing a hierarchy of of what goes where within a program. So things like mo movements should always go from fast to slow. You should do your high skill work at the point where your fatigue is lowest, right? Not using those, not falling into the trap of, you know, within the scope of CrossFit, they, there's a lot of wads that have skill elements and conditioning elements together. But he said, one of the things that he said was, that's a, if, if you get yourself in a high enough condition that the conditioning work doesn't fatigue you, but you have high proficiency of the skill work, you don't have to train them together. Right. And the other, the other point that he mentioned that I actually really love is like, if you get so strong the anaerobic work becomes aerobic work, then you don't necessarily need to do as much an, like aerobic work. Because if, if, especially in CrossFit, there's set weights for certain things. So if the set weight for a deadlift is 225 and your max is 315, it's going to be a very challenging deadlift workout. But if the set deadlift weight is 225 and your max deadlift is 600, that 225 becomes very easy and you don't have to expend a lot of energy to move it. Um, so him discussing you know, strength as the mother of all adaptations when it comes to lifting weights was something that I really, uh, I really enjoyed, um, especially with my, my background. You know, my ex-wife was a very high-level CrossFit competitor. I saw her go through a number of coaches. Um, and some of the coaches, the way they were programming, you know, while I'm not a CrossFitter, I can look at it and say, hey, there's no rhyme or reason to this. This guy's picking it out of a hat and she was always very injured then going to her coach who's currently her coach um, who trains it like a sport he used a high low sequencing model mm -hmm. he always he always did gymnastics first and never in a fatigued state and olympic lifting was prioritized you know, all these things it's like okay like there should be rhyme or reason when you're training things and you should have a plan as to when you're going to do these things, how much volume. Um, and that's something he touched on too. Volume is a metric of intensity, right? If you're doing a two hour run, it doesn't matter how slow you run. That's still an intense workout. So that's the duration because of the duration, right? So that's something that I really enjoyed. Yeah. Yeah. I think there's, there's a lot to take away from that. Right. And the biggest thing is, is something that we harp on, a lot is this, or at least I do, I don't know if you harp on it, but I've, I've written about is the idea of like pre-fatiguing um, your body to warm it up before you do your actual work, right? Like the people yeah. who do squats before they deadlift. And it's like, yeah, because you have to do squat in a meet, then you need to deadlift after your squat. It's like, well, no, if you get really good at both of them on separate days and you don't let your fitness drop, doing three squats before your deadlift should not like, that shouldn't be a problem. Right. Mm -hmm. But are you going to, it's like the idea of, are you willing to compromise all your deadlift training for one day or would it be better to always deadlift fresh and just get as strong as humanly possible and then show up to the meet. Right. And it's the same idea that the research has shown with people who they're like, I want to train aerobic work in a fat adaptive state because if I can oxidize fat then I'm going to have more ATP and then I'm going to be able to push myself and then I'll be able to get that carb rebound whenever I introduce it on race day and what the research shows is that by practicing in a diminished state to become fat adaptive decreases your ability to perform so much in those weeks you're becoming fat adaptive that the rebound you get from adding in carbs didn't do anything. I'm going to take you just back to baseline, right? Because you'd have to decrease your intent, your training intensity so much. Right. Back to baseline or a little bit worse. Yeah. So you wouldn't even get a training adaptation. From that. Right. So that's the same thing I think about when people are doing that type of stuff, right? It's like, 
you're constantly going into your, your deadlift fatigued because you're doing squats to warm up your deadlift. And that just doesn't make sense. I've right? used it. I've used that. And the reason I, the only time I'll ever implement it that way is if it's like light technique work, just to have another squat in there. I don't but agree. I'm like, but yeah, but doing the light technique work is not going to fatigue you for a deadlift. You could use your same argument. But what's the point of doing light technique work? Just to get an adaptation. If you, if you want another squat exposure during the week. But, but if you're an advanced lifter, you're going to need something that's 80, 85% for it to be worth your time. Yeah, but if you're not. If you're not, then you shouldn't be doing, then, then you shouldn't be doing it because you're going to get, if you're not strong enough to where you need a high percent and you're weak and you need a low percent, then you're probably not in good enough shape. I just, we can, we can agree to disagree on this one, but I, I don't use it all the time. I said, I have used it I would and it has it. worked. <laughs> I would never use it. <laughs> I just don't see the, uh, the validity in it. Um, if, if they want practice in their squat, then just squat after you, what's wrong with squatting after you deadlift? Oh, because you're going to be fatigued after you, well, yeah, you're going to be fatigued after you squat too. Well, yeah, but if the, if the intent behind that squat workout is going to be technique, you want to be fresh. Um, but you need a high enough percentage for it to actually be technique driven. And then if you go to a high enough percent to where you're getting technique work out of it, it's going to debilitate your ability to have great technique on your deadlift, right? You're robbing Peter to pay Paul. In both scenarios though. <laughs> but you have your own squat day. So it's not in both scenarios. Why, can't, why don't people respect the deadlift enough to give it its own day? God damn it. You guys are so disrespectful to the deadlift. You got to put shit in front of it all the time where squat always gets to be by itself. How did this become all the time? I said, I've, I have done it. <laughs> it, sounds, it sounds better when you can speak. When you speak in speaking absolutes. Yeah, yeah, it sounds way better. Never do it, never. Never, ever, yeah. But yeah, I mean, that's the idea, right? It's like needs analysis. And then once you get to that needs analysis, then it's like, okay, well, what's the most important thing that can be done while we're fresh? What can we get the most out of it? If you're in a fatigue state and you're doing something that's highly technical, like gymnastics that requires a lot of range of motion, a lot of flexibility, your risk of injury is going to go through the roof because you're going to, you're going to fuck something up because when you're fatigued, you don't make them the same exact precise technique movements that you would in a, in a fresh state. So I think there's a lot to that as well. And like you said, man, if you're doing a two hour workout and it's low intensity, it's still a two hour workout. Yeah. You're still fucking putting some strain on your body there. You know, I think, right. These active CrossFit's made this very popular is like this idea of like active recovery. Mm -hmm. I mean, I don't know if there's any research on it, I think there is a little bit, but what would you say, like 20 to 30 minutes tops for something like that? Yeah. Beyond that, it starts to get to in a too high of a recovery demand. I remember one of my one of my ex-wife's coaches, active recovery, go run a 10K. What? <laughs> I was like, uh no. Did he did he tempo it? Did he pace it? Nope. It was like a heart rate. Right. So it's like go run, go run 10K. That was right. Point. Go run 10K. Tell a CrossFitter to go run 10K, they're going to try to set a PR. 100%. That's what she Right. Um, but uh, yeah, I if I was going to do active recovery, uh, it would be something where there was heart rate undulation, so some type of tempo involved. Um, one thing that I've done in the past and, and I actually really enjoy is I'll hop on the assault bike really light, just ride it for two minutes, and then I'll have a circuit of three to five call them mo like mobility exercises, things like lightly loaded Cossack squats, um, you know, scat pull-ups, things like that. Um, and I'll do that like three to five times. You get, like you said, 20 to 30 minutes, get the blood flow going, and then you're done. To me, that's active recovery, but so could going for a walk. I was going to say, if you're going to work with power lifters like you do, maybe you can have them walk for two minutes, bend over, tie their shoe, that can get their heart rate up, and then they can go walk for another two minutes, and there you go, anaerobic conditioning. So I don't deal with fatties over here. <laughs> no, no fatties. 
Okay, so if you're trying to get in the best shape of your life and you're overweight, sorry, Paul does not want to work with you. He only wants to work with elite, high-performing, lean people. Um, so please send your resumes elsewhere. Resumes. Yeah, I require. You don't require CVs when they work with you. Uh, no, I don't. Oh, I need to. I just require them to tag me history. every time they go for a walk on Instagram. I know you do. <laughs> so stupid. <laughs> And then you give me shit if someone tags me, and then that's that's. Cool. Hey, listen, you you can't give me shit and then have someone do the same thing. I don't prescribe it. I don't prescribe it. I don't prescribe it either. Yes, you do. For nutrition clients. No, oh, okay, yeah, just to what keep their steps up. Yeah, yeah. People are so lazy in general, man. Dude, I mean, I'm sure you fall into that trap too, like before I actually track my steps, you can, I mean, I can be at my desk all day and I'll get up and I'm like, it's 5 PM. I'm like, I'm at 500 steps because I've been just working. I used and to now be that like I become, that. Yeah. I have crippling anxiety sometimes. So I'll just get up and walk. Oh, um, now that I become aware of it, I, I just get up and, and walk as much as I can. But before then I was like, I was like, man, I barely move. And yeah. And then, I mean, the research even shows, right. As you start to drop weight, as you start to do more intense yeah. exercise, you tend to do less when you're at home resting, you lose that fidget, you lose all those responses that create that need. So actually having people do those steps is something that's going to keep them accountable and like level level. Um, so yeah, so that covers day one and day two of the coaches corner summit. Uh, like I said, very happy with the quality of content. Um, if you guys are interested in any of these products that we have, we're going to separate each day. So we have the mental training leadership day, we have athletic development, we have nutrition and we have powerlifting. So we'll have four separate days with three speakers each. Um, you guys can buy those or you can buy them all combined. Um, so each day is going to be $50. And then if you combine everything, I believe it's $124, $129.99. 149 so you save you, you get a day for free yeah so there you go uh there, it's all up at coachescorneru.com make sure you guys check that out if you like the podcast go to itunes it's on spotify now leave a review five star rating is greatly appreciated and uh, we'll catch you guys next week at coach's corner <laughs>